a very precious introduction, and I did not know that about Amber. That was so precious, it brought tears to my eyes, and so did the beautiful music, um, the hallelujahs, but especially Great Is Thy Faithfulness. We were singing that to my mother when she moved to heaven, and we're all gathered around her bed, and so um, this has already been a very personal morning for me. Thank you for inviting me. I feel honored and privileged to be here, and if I could just say a personal word, I want to thank Pastor Anderson for his affirmation, his support, his encouragement of women in ministry. And I know Pastor Sandy would affirm that, but I just, um, you know, there are um, a lot of places I go, I, I go wherever God sends and speak what he puts on my heart, but to be in a church on a Sunday morning and for a pastor to give up his pulpit to me is a, a rare privilege. Pastor Anderson, thank you. I just, um, thank you. So I'm glad to be here, and it's just my custom. I know the, they've prayed for me at the airport. They prayed for me back in Pastor Anderson's study. They've prayed for me backstage. They've prayed for me here. But, you know, um, uh, I feel very prayed for. But it's interesting. Prayers of other people are not the same as my prayers for me, okay? So if, it's just my habit um, to pray before I speak because I want you to know I know I need the Lord, okay? So, Father, we bow before you now, and we thank you so much for your presence in this place. Oh, my goodness, how we thank you for the dear Holy Spirit. And we worship you as the God of creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came down to us, not only in the person of Jesus Christ, but when he went back to heaven, sent down the Holy Spirit that we might have him live within us. And so I ask now that you just do that supernatural work and you help each one of us to comprehend what it is that the Spirit is saying, that we would have ears to hear, Lord, and as a result, we would have minds to receive and a heart that responds and that we would uh, leave this place. Our, our direction, our decisions, um, what we're about would be in line with your will, that we would be pleasing to you. So I ask your blessing on the message, Lord, and blessing on those who hear it, not because we deserve it, but because we're asking boldly in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I don't know if um, any of you have ever been lonely. Anybody struggle with loneliness? And uh, maybe through divorce or death or disease, you find yourself somewhat isolated. And you can be in a crowd and still be lonely, right? And have nobody that you feel that you can confide in, you can share your dreams with, your hopes with, your fears, your tears. There's nobody that you really trust to keep your confidences. And, um, and uh, is, is there somebody who's feeling lonely? You know, the statistics tell us 22% of American adults are so desperately lonely they have suicidal thoughts. And that loneliness is an epidemic amongst millennials, I think because they live in sort of a virtual world. And I just want to share with you, in the last four years, loneliness has knocked at my door. My, four and a half years ago, my husband, I found him unresponsive in our pool, and he went to heaven. And three years after that, my father went to heaven, and we were expecting him to go sometime soon because he was 99, but not that morning. And both my husband and my father left without saying goodbye, not because they meant to. That's just the way it was, but there was no chance to say thank you one more time or I love you one more time. So there was no sort of closure to that. Six months after my, my daddy went to heaven, I was diagnosed with cancer, went through surgery and, you know, follow-up chemotherapy, radiation, and the rest of it. So I know about the temptation to be lonely, but what I want to tell you is that loneliness may have knocked at my door, but it never came in. And the reason for that is because of the constant companionship of the Holy Spirit. And I have never lost my joy, never lost my peace, never lost that sense of God's blessing in my life. And I know it's because of the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? And the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in the upstairs room with his disciples. They'd had supper together. He taught them about heaven. He taught them he was the vine and they were the branches. He taught them about persecution. And then he taught them about the Holy Spirit. And it was at, I think the disciples were beginning to get the idea, he's leaving us. 
And we're going to be responsible for his ministry and his visible absence. And so inside they were saying, no, don't go. You can't leave us. And, and that's when he taught them about the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to John chapter 16? Or I think it may be up on the screen, but, you know, I don't, not that I don't trust screens, but I like my hard copy. I've got it on my iPad, my phone, but I like my Bible, Bible, okay. So I'm reading from uh, chapter 16 of John's gospel, starting with verse 5. Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. But I'll tell you the truth. It's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So just pause for a moment. He's saying it's better for the visible Jesus to leave so that you would have the invisible Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing thing. It's better to have the Holy Spirit than to have the visible Jesus present here. That's, that's stunning, okay, to me. All right, verse 9. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt, excuse me, verse 8, in regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment, verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. So let me just pause on that last verse because it's sort of a strange verse. In a little while, you'll see me, then you won't. Do you remember after the resurrection when he suddenly appeared to Mary Magdalene? And then he disappeared. And he suddenly appeared to the disciples in the upstairs room, and then he disappeared. And suddenly appeared to the disciples going to Emmaus, and then he disappeared. And suddenly appeared beside, the, you, know, you know, now you see me, now you don't. And I think he was teaching them about the Holy Spirit, that whether you could see Jesus visibly or not, he would always be present with them in the person of the Holy Spirit. So there are seven things I want to remind you about. I, I know that... You know about the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was raised in church, I was raised, I went to church every Sunday. I was raised in a committed Christian home. I was never taught about the Holy Spirit. And in church, he was referred to as the Holy Ghost. And for a little girl, the ghost was sort of off-putting. So I just treated him like an optional extra, you know. So you have the <laughs> grand, glorious God the Father, and you have the beloved Jesus the Son. But I didn't know what to do with the Holy Ghost, and so I just sort of you know, neglected him, actually, didn't pay any attention to him. And it wasn't until I got into the scriptures as a young adult that I discovered more of who he is. So there's seven things about the Holy Spirit that from time to time I need to be reminded of, and I want to remind you. And the first thing this morning is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a ghost. He is not a flame of fire. He is not a dove. He's not an ecstatic feeling. The Holy Spirit is a living, invisible person. He has a mind to think. He has a will to act. He has a heart to feel. He is referred to as a third person of the Trinity, and I always thought that was the least, you know? And, but it's, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is the least. In the Old Testament, it's God the Father primarily revealed. In the Gospels, it's primarily God the Son who's revealed. Acts and the Epistles, it's primarily God the Holy Spirit who's revealed. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity to be more fully revealed in Scripture. But he's been there from the beginning. What does that mean? Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. That's the Holy Spirit. So he has many names in Scripture, and each one sort of describes a beautiful aspect of his character. And in the book, I go to, through some of the names, the helper, the strengthener, the standby, you know, the comforter. And, but the one I want to share with you is from John chapter 14, and it's verse, uh, I can't remember, uh, 16, I think it is, when Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm going to come to you, and, um, I'm, and the Father's going to give you another counselor. In other words, Jesus is a counselor, and the Father is going to give him another counselor, and another means exactly the same as. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit is another counselor. He's exactly the same as I am. So don't misunderstand me, because the Holy Spirit is a distinct person in his own right, but he is all that Jesus is without his man's physical body. He's like Jesus without skin. So I don't know if you've ever wish you could sit down at your kitchen table and have Jesus pull up a chair and 
you tell Jesus about that decision you've got to make and you tell him about the trouble you're having with your children, you tell him that you just can't stretch your finances to cover the bills this month, you want to tell him about the trouble you're having at your job, or you know how you, you just want somebody to talk to that will give you wisdom and counsel and understanding and that's who the Holy Spirit is. So go ahead and pull up your chair, you know, and just talk to him. He's right there. He is Jesus in me. That's why I named the book. He's Jesus in me, the person of the Holy Spirit. So when did he come? How do we know his presence? Jesus said in verse 7 of this chapter, he said, I'm going to send him to you. And it was at Pentecost. Do you remember 50 days after the resurrection and uh, 10 days after the ascension, the disciples had gathered in that upstairs room in Jerusalem and they were praying. And you know, one of the things they were praying for is, Lord, keep your promise. Send down your Holy Spirit. So I'm assuming they went to the temple because of what happened and they... And, John and Tim, all the disciples are there, and, and suddenly there's a sound of rushing wind, and the trees weren't moving, and the leaves weren't scurrying, but, but there was a sound like of a tornado moving through. And John looks at Peter, and he's got a flame of fire on his head, and Peter looks at Andrew, he's got a flame of fire on his head, and Andrew looks at Matthew, and he's got a flame, and they were filled with an overwhelming sense of the presence of Jesus, and they opened their mouths in a symphony of praise, and all of Jerusalem heard the gospel in their own language, and the disciples knew the Holy Spirit had been given. So I want to try to describe the drama of this because it was an historical event like Bethlehem, like the cross, like the resurrection, like the ascension. There'll never be another Pentecost. When we pray for another Pentecost, we're praying for revival, but there'll never be another Pentecost because it was history splitting. So before Pentecost, in the Old Testament, saints were saved and made right with God when they obeyed his word and they placed faith in his word that said, if you bring, a, and I'm going to simplify this, all right, bring a little lamb, and you bring it to the priest at the temple, and you grasp the lamb with both hands, and the sinner would confess his sin. It's as though his guilt and his shame and his sin was transferred to the lamb. The sinner took the knife, killed the lamb. The priest would take the blood, sprinkle it on the altar to make atonement for sin. And... Hebrew says that the blood of lambs and bulls can't possibly take away sin. But it's like every time somebody did that, and in obedience to God's word, faith in what God said, and sacrificed that lamb, and confessed his sin, and claimed it for himself, God would give them an IOU note. I owe you forgiveness. I owe you forgiveness. I owe you forgiveness. So Jesus of Nazareth is walking beside the Jordan River, and John the Baptist says, look, there goes the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. And when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, God paid up all those IOU notes. So in the Old Testament, people were saved and made right with it. We can use the word saved. They were made right with God, forgiven of their sin, when they looked forward to the cross, okay? They didn't understand it. They didn't know Jesus' name. But when they exercised their faith in God's word and sacrificed that lamb, they were given forgiveness that was paid up by Jesus, all right? You and I today, we look back to the cross. And I'm so thankful we don't have to go to a temple and kill a lamb and have blood spurting everywhere and... But we still come to the cross and we grasp the Lamb of God with our hands of faith and we confess our sin and it's as though our sin is transferred to the Lamb of God and it was our sin that killed him. So don't you know, accuse the Romans or the Jews. It was my sin that was responsible for nailing him to the cross and the blood of Jesus has cleansed me of all of my sin, past, present, future. I'm forgiven. I'm made right with God through the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Amen. So Old Testament, they look forward to the cross. Now we look back to the cross. But let me tell you something. You and I have something the Old Testament saints knew nothing about. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody to equip them for work. And one of the best examples is Saul of Kish, the first king of Israel. And the Holy Spirit came upon him and changed him from being a keeper of donkeys to the leader of Israel. And, and then when Saul sinned, God removed the Holy Spirit from him. And so the second king of Israel, David, was anointed. The Holy Spirit came upon him, changed him from a shepherd of sheep to leading the nation. And when David sinned with Bathsheba, do you remember what he prayed? Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Because David knew the Holy Spirit could be given and the Holy Spirit could be taken away. So the Holy Spirit was there in the Old Testament, but he came upon people and then he was removed and since Pentecost. 
when you and I come to that Lamb of God and we clasp him with our hands of faith and we confess our sin and tell him we're sorry, we claim him as our Savior and our Lord, we open up our hearts and we invite him to come in. He comes in in the person of the Holy Spirit and the Bible says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. It's a permanent relationship. Praise God. When I was a little girl, I'd been watching a picture on television about Jesus, and it came to the scene of the cross, and I knew that he had died for me. I can't remember the year, but I know it was a good Friday, and I was upstairs in my bedroom afterwards, and I was so convicted, believing that it was my sin that put him on the cross, that I got down on my knees, and I confessed my sin and told God I was sorry and asked him to forgive me. And I invited Jesus to come into my heart. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. So I invited Jesus to come into my heart. Jesus can't possibly come into my heart. He's living in heaven in a man's body, getting ready to come back and rule the world. But he understood what I was saying. And he came into me in the person of the Holy Spirit. And I was born again into God's family because God doesn't have any grandchildren, right? Just because I'm Billy Graham's daughter doesn't mean I'm a child of God. I had to make that decision for myself. So what I want to ask you is when have you made that same decision? When did you come humbly like a child by faith to the cross and confess that you're a sinner? Tell God you're sorry. Ask him to forgive you. Believe Jesus is the lamb who died for your sin. And surrender your life to him as Lord and open up your heart and invite him to come in. He's a gentleman. He's not going to come in unless you invite him to come in. But you can invite Jesus and you invite the Holy Spirit and it's the same thing, okay? But can you remember a point in time when you've done that? And if you can't remember a point in time like that, how do you know you've been born again into God's family? Jesus told Nicodemus, a religious leader who knew it all up here, you must be born again. It's not an option. Not if you want to go to heaven, not if you want to get right with God, not if you want to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Similar to Mary, the Virgin Mary, when the angel came to her <clears throat> and said, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And Mary said, how can that be? I've never known a man. And the angel said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And that which is conceived within you is going to be the life of the Son of God. And Mary submitted to God's will, said, be it unto me according to your word. And, and she conceived the physical life of Jesus inside of her. When you and I come to the cross, we confess our sin, claim Jesus as Savior and Lord, invite him to come in. We conceive within us the spiritual life of Jesus, okay? We become a new creation on the inside. It's the Holy Spirit living in us. I have a mind to think God's thoughts and a heart to love people I don't even like and a will to do the right thing and... And I, it's, I still have my old nature, don't misunderstand, but I have a new creation. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the life of Jesus living inside of me. So I want you to make sure before you leave this auditorium, if you're watching online or listening on the radio, however you're accessing this message, make sure that you have received the Holy Spirit into you. It makes all the difference. You can be in a place like this and feel the presence of Jesus because he lives in so many people here leave here and you feel suddenly something's different and I feel alone and, and it's because you have stepped away from the presence of Jesus. He's not in you. So make sure that you've come to the cross, confessed your sin, told God you're sorry, willing to repent, turn away from your sin, claiming Jesus as your Savior, your Lord, inviting him to come in, be born again today into the family of God. So the Holy Spirit's presence is available to come into anyone, everyone who receives Jesus by faith. And thirdly, I want to remind you of his power because when he comes into you, he can change you from the inside out. And Peter is a good example of that. You remember um, during the trials of Jesus and Peter was in that outside courtyard and a little servant girl came up and said, I think you're one of his disciples. And he said, no, I'm not. Somebody else said, you know, you've got a Galilean accent. I think you're, no, I'm not. Third person came up and said, I saw you in the garden tonight. You're one of his, no, I'm, and he cursed and denied three times he knew Jesus because he was so afraid of what other people would say, what other people would do. He was intimidated. And fast forward 50 days later, he's at Pentecost after he's received the Holy Spirit. 
And he stands up. And in that same audience were some of the Sadducees and the Pharisees who had condemned Jesus to death and some of the Roman soldiers who had nailed him to the cross and some of the very same people who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And Peter gets up and says, this Jesus of Nazareth whom you have crucified is both Lord and Christ. He's the Messiah. You have just crucified your Messiah. And they were cut to the quick and they said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, you repent of your sin and you'll be baptized and you'll be forgiven. And they did and they were and the church was born. But look at the difference in Peter. And when he was arrested and beaten and told not to preach the name of Jesus, he said, I can't help but say and speak the things I've seen and heard. You can turn me loose. I'm going to go right back to preaching. And he did. And the di you see the difference. And the Holy Spirit can take someone like me, timid and shy and whatever, and put me up here. He can take you and put you across the street with your neighbor. He can take you and talk to the co-worker or, you know, just let him loose in your life. Surrender everything to him. Let the Holy Spirit take over. In this politically correct culture, we need to name the name of Jesus and not be intimidated by the opinions of other people. So he has the power to change Peter. I, I share in the book several instances where he's had the power to change me, but I want to point out he has the power to change those who are on your prayer list, you know. People that maybe you were praying for, maybe you quit praying for them because they seem so hopeless, and you think, how can they ever come to faith? How, you know, how can you share the gospel with somebody effectively who is richer than you are, or poorer than you are, or younger than you are, or older than you are, has more education than you, or less education, or you know, it can be so hard, can it, to share the gospel? And, and you need logic, do you need eloquence, do you need to use the right verses? And, you know, just think of the simple verse, John 3, 16, and try to share that with somebody today. For God so loved the world. God? What God is that? You know, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Only begotten son? You mean you think he only has one? I think we're all sons of God. That whosoever believes in him would not perish? You, you mean you think there's just one way to heaven? You know, one way to God? That's so exclusive. And perish? You believe in a hell? I think when we die, we just all snuff out. And How do you convince that person that a man who lived and died and rose again 2,000 years ago is relevant for their lives today? You know something? You can't. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convince them. And these verses say he's the one that convinces of their sin and their need to get right with God and judgment to come if they don't. So that frees you and me up to just love them. We don't have to judge them. We don't have to work hard, manipulate, and contrive. And we just love them and pray for them that the Holy Spirit would hover over their hearts and minds like he did planet earth in Genesis chapter 1 and prepare them to receive God's word and invite them to church or share a book with them or you know, somehow see if you can get God's word into their lives and, and pray that the Holy Spirit on the, would just work on the inside, their hearts and minds and bring them that point of repentance and the knowledge they need a savior. So it sort of frees us up, doesn't it? that we're not responsible to lead people to Christ. We're responsible to share the gospel. And it's the Holy Spirit who will do the convincing and the changing of that person. Praise God for his power. It's not been diluted, depleted over the years. Just as powerful as it was in Genesis 1, just as powerful at Pentecost, just as powerful today. So fourthly, I want to remind you of his precepts. The Holy Spirit in chapter, uh, this chapter, verse 13, says that he is the spirit of truth. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, training, and righteousness. So this book from Genesis to Revelation has been authored, God-breathed by the Holy Spirit. So to say that it has myths, to say that it has errors, to say that it has mistakes or legends is to slur the integrity of the spirit of truth. So what's your opinion of the Bible? I think you need to settle it. You know, people can pick their way through it. You know, I, I believe it contains God's word. But 
Who could believe in a talking snake? So we toss out Adam and Eve. Who could believe that all those animals could get on a boat? So we toss out Noah. Who could believe a fish could swallow a man? We toss out Jonah. Who could believe a man could rise from the dead? And when I get to heaven, I may find that, you know, there's a battle in the Old Testament. Instead of 200,000 people killed, it was 20,000 because a zero was added somewhere. I don't care. You know, but I don't want to get to heaven and find that I discarded things that God was imparting to me, truth, and said, I don't believe them because with my finite mind, I can't understand them. And all those stories I referred to, Jesus referred to. If he believed they're true, then who am I to say they're not? Revelation 19 makes it very clear. You and I don't stand in judgment over God's word. God's word stands in judgment over you and me. So read it. Read it. Read the Word. If you need help, go to my website, anngramlots.org. I have free videos and Bible studies and things to help you read God's Word so you can hear the Spirit whispering to you through the pages. So I decided a long time ago, I don't understand it all. I can't answer all of your questions about it, but I believe this is God's Word. And He's a gentleman. He doesn't lie. He doesn't spin the truth. Fifthly, the purity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holy, totally separate from sin. And the best definition of holiness, I think, would be to be like Jesus. And in Jesus, there's, there's no unkindness, no meanness, no pridefulness, no bitterness, no unforgiveness, no sinfulness at all. He is holy, holy, holy. And he demands holiness of his people. And you and I compare ourselves with each other, and I think, you know, I'm better than you are. I'm not as good as he is, but I'm okay. But God doesn't compare us with each other. He compares us with the holiness of the Holy Spirit. And he tells us to be holy. What sin in your life needs to be put out so that you can reflect the purity of the Holy Spirit. And... You know, the little voice that comes along and says, you know, you're rotten to the core. You can never please God. You just never break that habit. You're no good friend. That's the devil, all right? The Holy Spirit doesn't convict like that. The Holy Spirit comes along, and you go out to that party, and you think, you know, I don't feel comfortable here anymore. And you leave, and, and then you go to that bar, and you go to take that drink. You know, I just don't feel comfortable doing this anymore. And you leave, and you're with those friends, and they start talking trash, and I don't think I should talk like this. That's the Holy Spirit. He will start cleaning you up just peace if you'll, if you'll let him, and if you'll open your heart and life to him and just be responsive to his nudges, and he will make you holy as Jesus is holy. So whatever the sin is that you're, you know, we can cling to it, can't we? There's pleasure in sin for a season. It may be a relationship, maybe pornography, like a black mold, like a poison that's creeping in. You think it doesn't hurt anybody, but it's destroying your spirit. Bitterness, unforgiveness towards somebody who abused you, somebody in your family. Listen to me. You forgive them because God has forgiven you. And so it's an act of worship to forgive them. You say, and if I forgive them, they'll get by with it. No, they won't. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He'll deal with them, but you just let God set you free. Love them. Reach out to bless them, and you'll find yourself just rising up over that bitterness and unforgiveness. And So I don't know what it is. I could stand up here and guess all day, but whatever the sin is, the Holy Spirit brings it to your mind. You confess it by name. Bring it to the cross. Ask the Lord to just cleanse you of it, and ask the Holy Spirit to make you holy. He will. That's one of his jobs. <laughs> his prayers as he's going through this process. Romans 8, 26 says that he prays for us without words. In the last four years, there have been times when I couldn't pray. You had times like that. You had no words for prayer, just deep groaning or moaning or grief or tears. And at such a time, the Holy Spirit who lives in me knows how to pray for me. And he conveys my prayers and my needs before the throne of God. And you have a prayer partner? I hope that you do. But if you don't, the Holy Spirit is your prayer partner. 
He knows you. He understands you. He can feel your feelings, and he can take the things that you can't articulate and present them before the Father, and he knows how to get answers to his prayers. And listen to me while he's praying for you. He loves you. This was a new thought for me as I was studying the Holy Spirit because it says in Ephesians 4 that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit, and we grieve him through our sin or neglect or disobedience. But I thought, you know, I grieve for my mother. She's been gone now 13 years. I still grieve because I miss her. I grieve for my husband because I loved him and I miss him. And I grieve for my daddy because I loved him and I miss him. And so I thought, you know, grief is a love word. And if I can grieve the Holy Spirit, it must mean that the Holy Spirit loves me. And I had never thought, I thought when I received Jesus and he came into my heart that God said, all right, Holy Spirit, go inside Anne and you're assigned to her now and make her good and, you know, and then one day the Holy Spirit would give me to the Father and say, well, I did the best I could with what I had. And it was like I was his assignment. And then I found out that the Holy Spirit loves me. He came into me because he wants to come in. He's emotionally involved in my life. And when I do the right thing, he rejoices. And I do the wrong thing, he grieves. Because he wants the best for me. He wants me to have the fullness of God's blessing. So the Holy Spirit loves you. And he loves you. And he loves you. And he loves you. And he wants to conform you into the image of Jesus. Praise God. When he prays for us, he does it from a heart that overflows with love. Lastly, the priority of the Holy Spirit. In verses 13 and 14, it says that the Holy Spirit's priority is the written word of God. He takes the things of God and he helps us understand. So before you read your Bible, pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you at least one thing that you can understand. But he draws us into the written word, which he authored, that we might know the living word, who is Jesus. He's all about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's priority is Jesus. So if I can just explain it this way. You know, a jigsaw puzzle, all the funny little pieces, and you turn it over, there's a bit of picture on the one side, and you put the puzzle pieces together, and you replicate the picture on the face of the box, and you've solved the puzzle, Okay. A lot of people think the Bible is like a jigsaw puzzle. All these funny little pieces, and they don't know how it fits together until the Holy Spirit comes and turns over the pieces, and we see the bit of picture on the other side. We put it all together, and it's the picture of a man, Jesus. The whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. Genesis chapter 1 Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And all the way through Genesis 1, you have that phrase, and God said. And we think that's nouns and pronouns going out of the mouth of God until we come to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, that says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and His name is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit turns over the puzzle piece, and we see Jesus, the pre-incarnate Son of God, being the creator of everything in the beginning. Chapter 2 of Genesis when the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed his life into him and the Holy Spirit turns over the puzzle piece and the Lord God is the pre-incarnate Son of God. Our very breath comes from him. In chapter 3, Adam and Eve hidden in the bushes because they're sinned and the Lord God comes and finds them and brings them to confession of their sin and then he kills an animal and he clothes them in the skins and you wonder if there are tears coming down his cheeks because he knows he will eventually be the lamb whose blood will cover them and his robe of righteousness that will cover them. And, and it's the Lord God, pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus, before Bethlehem, taking care of his sinful children and clothing them. And we see him in chapter 4 and 5, but the next time we see a good picture of him is in chapter 18. Abraham sitting there in his tent, and it's in the heat of the day. And there are three... Men that come up, and one of them says, this time next year, I'm going to come back and visit you, Abraham, and you and your wife, Sarah, are going to have a baby. And Abraham was 99, and Sarah was 89, and they didn't have children when they could have had children. And the next year, <laughs> Sarah had a baby at the age of 90, and Abraham was 100, because the one man was the Lord God, pre-incarnate Son of God, Jesus, before Bethlehem. And then we find Jacob, Abraham's grandson, in exile over 20 years, coming back to claim his inheritance and his own strength. And he goes to cross over the Jabbok River, and he bumps into a man who won't let him pass. They wrestle all night, and finally the man breaks Jacob's hip. But Jacob, instead of crumbling into the creek, he 
he puts his arms around the man and he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the man blesses him and changes his name from Jacob to Israel, a prince who has power with God because Jacob was broken and surrendered to God. And that man in the river was the pre-incarnate son of God, Jesus before Bethlehem. And Joshua going around Jericho trying to figure out how to take the enemy stronghold. He bumps into the captain of the Lord's host and he says... Take off, he tells Joshua, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And then he told him how to take the enemy's stronghold that had nothing to do with military strategy and everything to do with prayer and dependence and expectance and obedience. And the walls came tumbling down because that captain of the Lord's host was a pre-incarnate son of God, Jesus before Bethlehem. And you go on through the Old Testament, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to that statue of gold. Nebuchadnezzar throws them into the fiery furnace. And then he rubs his eyes and he says, whoa, wait a minute. Didn't I throw in three men? Why do I see four? And the fourth is like the Son of God. Jesus, pre-incarnate, showing up in the fire with his children. Isaiah, the year that King Uzziah died, looked up. His life was falling apart, and he saw the Lord seated on the throne, the pre-incarnate Son of God in charge of everything that's going on in Isaiah's life and the world and your life and our world, and seated on the throne. And then we come to that starry night outside of Bethlehem. When the angels appear and announce to the shepherds that the Savior has been born, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And we run with the shepherds and we come into the stable. We find the manger and there, sure enough, is a little baby lying in it, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And we find ourselves looking into the face of God, pre-incarnate who's become carnate grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man until he is crucified on a Roman cross. That Holy Spirit turns over that puzzle piece and we know that's not a disaster. It's not a tragedy. That's the Lamb of God being sacrificed for my sin. And he shows us the empty tomb because three days later, he rose up from the dead. Jesus is alive. He's alive and he ascended into heaven. And that ultimate puzzle piece... One day the sky will, not, will unfold and the white horse will appear whose rider is faithful and true, coming back followed by the armies of heaven and he will rule and reign this world in righteousness and justice and truth and love and... Oh, please listen to me. The Holy Spirit's priority is Jesus and he wants to get you into this book that he might reveal Jesus to you. Jesus is as he is revealed in Scripture. You can hear a lot of things about him. People talk about God, which God is that. My God wouldn't say that. I don't think my God would do that. Well, I want to know God as he is, not the way people say he is, okay? And he's exactly as he's revealed in Scripture, and Jesus is exactly the way he's revealed in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit will take the things of God and help you understand. Maybe not everything, but something. So, what's your priority? You can tell by the way you spend your money your time, what preoccupies your thoughts. I challenge you, put Jesus first in your life. Spend time every morning reading your Bible, praying just to get to know him, that you might love him, that you might serve him, that you might obey him, that you might enjoy him, that one day <laughs> you go to live with him forever. It's all about Jesus. So my challenge to you as we conclude Would you make sure the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? If you can't pinpoint a specific time when you invited the Holy Spirit from outside to come inside, then do that this morning. I'll pray with you in just a moment. And if you know that you know that you know that he lives inside of you, then would you surrender everything to him? Because listen to me, when you invite the Holy Spirit in, you get all the Holy Spirit that you're ever going to get. He's a person. You don't get him in pieces, okay? So, so the newest believer has as much of the Holy Spirit as the oldest believer. But here's the catch. Sometimes he seems to get us in pieces. And we'll give him, you know, Sunday morning when we go to church, but not Monday morning at the office. And we'll give him Wednesday night at Bible study, but not Saturday night when we're with our friends. And we sort of pick and choose what we give him. And so my challenge, just give him everything. Open up your heart and life and invite the Holy Spirit to fill you until you overflow and other people then can see Jesus in you 
and want to know you, want to know him for themselves. So pray with me for a moment. And just if there is someone watching online or listening on radio or here in this service, and you don't know that you've ever received Jesus into your heart, then you can pray a prayer, a simple prayer, something like this. Dear God, I want to know that you live inside of me. So right now, I confess that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry, and I'm willing to turn away from my sin. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, and right now I grasp with my hands of faith the Lamb of God, and I believe Jesus has taken my guilt and my shame and my sin, cleansed me with his blood, and I believe he rose up from the dead to give me eternal life. So in his name, would you give me eternal life? And I believe that's heaven when I die, but it's also a right relationship with you now. And I open up my heart, and I invite Jesus to come live inside of me in the person of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And for the rest of us, Father, I pray for many here who know you, they've been born again, but through busyness in life, responsibilities, life can sometimes just be overwhelming and we neglect you, we disobey you, we turn away from you, not deliberately, but just drift from you. And so I'm praying that today you would draw us back to yourself that we would open up our hearts and fully surrender to the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is Lord, there is freedom. So I ask that you take this message and take it deep. Bless us each one, I pray, please, in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. The Holy Spirit. I'm going to turn this part of the service over to the Owens Mills campus. And in just a moment, Pastor Sandy Pope is going to come up and give you some final words to conclude today's service. Ridgeway Community Church, very possibly, would not be here if it wasn't for the Graham family. My wife coming all the way from Korea and being brought in. We didn't want to tell you that last night when we were together because we wanted you to hear it for the first time. But the first lady of this church, after being saved for a couple of years, went to Bible college. And that's where I laid eyes on her. And together we came here to start Bridgeway. So we want to say thank you, not only for your entire family, but we want to thank you for bringing God's word so faithfully to us to teach us about the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's give it up for Anne Graham Lotz, Jesus in me, experiencing the Holy Spirit as a constant companion. What do you say for God's word coming down from Anne Graham Lotz? Why don't you stand to your feet, Pastor Sandy? We'll see you soon.